start looking at this uh, interesting phenomenon that we have been ignoring for too long. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that there weren't people looking at uh, emotion in different domains. Uh, educational psychology um, has a, a rich um, tradition of uh, research into um, achievement emotions, um, specifically Pekrun and uh, his colleagues who developed the control value theory of uh, academic emotions, uh, where they present a three dimension taxonomy um, firstly, valence, um, so emotions can be placed on the continuum of valence going from negative to positive. Activation, so again, uh, emotions can uh, vary in activation levels, so from very high activation of arousal to very low um, arousal and activation. And then also uh, the dimension of objective focus which answers the question whether uh, an emotion that a learner is experiencing, is it activity related or outcome related? So um, I've been um, arguing for more attention to um, the emotional dimensions of second language acquisition uh, and also to the psychological uh, dimension. So um, I explained that I um, reiterated my call over the years uh, to pay more attention to emotions uh, in second language acquisition. Uh, and I was quite happy, in fact, when Peter McIntyre and uh, his Canadian colleagues uh, reacted and, and, and uh, started saying similar things, namely that uh, emotions are fundamentally important motivators. And they disagreed with Zoltan Dornier on that, um, according to whom um, uh, emotions could not be motivators uh, in themselves, that uh, emotions played, uh, a, had a back seat uh, in the motivational process. And this was, in fact, uh, a discussion that was um, ongoing with uh, um, Zoltan uh, until uh, he died, uh, unfortunately, two years ago. So in a paper with uh, Peter and also some uh, colleagues, we uh, linked uh, Gardner's um, different um, attitude and motivation dimensions with the PANAS, which is a, a test that measures 10 positive, 10 negative emotions that um, participants um, experienced in the previous uh, week. Uh, and we found that how motivated uh, students reported to be was in fact linked um, uh, to their positive emotions. So we hadn't expected that link because we, we thought that how you felt in the week, how could that be linked with motivation, which is a much longer term construct. But it was, and it was in fact the first study that, that specifically linked um, attitude and motivation dimensions with uh, learner uh, emotions. So we decided that we, we, we wanted to uh, do more work uh, in this domain. Um, you remember I just complained that there wasn't much work on uh, emotion in SLA. Uh, in fact, I think the situation is changing. Uh, so I, I made the joke that uh, the elephants um, have uh, lifted up, lifted up um, looking at the Modern Language Journal, which is one of the big journals in applied linguistics. Uh, I uh, calculated the number of uh, papers between uh, 1917, when it was created, and 2009, and, and only uh, 7.6 uh, paper uh, on average uh, a year had the word emotion in it. Um, typically, if it had emotion in 90% of the cases, it was uh, anxiety. Uh, but since 2010, uh, 180 papers, and I'm sure um, that now there are many more, um, had the, the, the word emotion in it, uh, so the, the average has gone up considerably, and that was in 2019. I'm sure that if I redid the calculation today, that the number would uh, be higher still. Now, I need to um, explain a little bit why uh, people in applied linguistics got interested in emotions. Um, it was, in fact, 
because we discovered positive psychology. Uh, and it was a paper by uh, Mac uh, Peter McIntyre and Tammy Gregerson in 2012. You see the references there at the bottom. Uh, they introduced uh, positive psychology uh, in uh, an applied linguistics journal, and that's how we learned about it. And um, it, it uh, created a buzz, and suddenly uh, a lot of people became really interested in this. So the, the basic tenets of um, positive psychology is that we shouldn't just focus on the things that go wrong in life, that we should also focus on the things that go well. And hence, instead of just being obsessed about depression, we should also look at happiness uh, and hence uh, a, a different perspective, a more holistic perspective that you can't just focus on the things that go wrong and the negative things you also need to look at the positive things and you need uh, a bit of balance. So you need to look at topics like flow, hope, courage, well-being, optimism. Uh, and, and you see uh, the other ones there. Um, also, um, uh, a realization that um, teaching a foreign language is about more than just, in fact, the transmission of grammar rules and vocabulary lists. It's also making sure that the learners uh, become wiser, uh, more resilient, uh, happier, that they flourish and, and that the teacher helps them uh, in uh, a positive subjective uh, experience. So that's a, a main pillar of positive psychology. The second one is positive individual traits. Uh, so things like grit and resilience. Uh, and the third one is positive institutions. And in fact, I'm, I'm uh, working on a special issue in the model, modern lang language journal um, to publish more on the, the things that institutions can do to um, improve uh, the atmosphere within the institution, the atmosphere between uh, the leaders of the institution, between the colleagues of the institution, because that will obviously have uh, effects on the relationship uh, between the teachers and the students. And so um, uh, Peter and Tammy um, talked specifically about uh, the work of uh, Barbara Fredrickson, <clears throat> a positive psychologist who had introduced uh, the broaden and build model. Uh, and her idea was that positive emotions uh, facilitate the building of resources because when you are in a good mood, uh, your perspective opens up, uh, you're able to learn new things. Whereas um, if you are in the grip of negative emotions, if you are terribly anxious, in fact, you uh, display the opposite tendency, your focus narrow, you feel threatened, you want to hide, uh, and, and you will typically not remember much uh, of the input. So it's crucial from a pedagogical point of view uh, to make sure that as teachers uh, we uh, create a positive emotion in our classrooms so that students will progress. So um, here is a picture of Peter and me uh, presenting uh, a first version of our Two Faces of Janus uh, paper at uh, AAAL uh, in Boston in 2012. Uh, and it was um, the first time that we uh, talked about this. And, and uh, it, it's interesting because we realized that this was something new. And as we presented uh, our paper in the room, there was a buzz. People were excited and we thought, huh, this seems to be going well. So we submitted the paper to the Modern Language Journal, who promptly rejected it. And we thought, oh, damn. They don't like it. Let's uh, rewrite it and submit it somewhere else. And so we submitted it to uh, Mirek Pavlak's uh, new journal uh, studies uh, in second language learning and teaching. And uh, after some revisions, they accepted it. And now it became our most cited paper. I think uh, it has been cited 1,200 times uh, so far. And so in that paper, we um, included both um, foreign language classroom anxiety 
using the classical definition and the classical scale uh, designed by Elaine Horitz uh, and colleagues. Uh, so her definition of a classroom anxiety as being this distinct complex of self-perceptions, beliefs, feelings, behaviors related to classroom language learning arising from the uniqueness of the language learning process. And so uh, we, in fact, Elaine Horitz was PhD's former um, committee member. So um, uh, Elaine was a, a really good friend of ours. Unfortunately, she also died a couple of years ago. Um, and we had <clears throat> this discussion, Peter and I, whether anxiety and enjoyment were in fact opposite ends of the same dimension, or whether they were in fact separate dimensions. So, so that was our uh, guiding uh, research question. And so we designed uh, a foreign language enjoyment scale, I will show uh, it to you in a minute, uh, which we described as a complex positively balanced emotion with medium to high arousal resulting from a combination of challenge and perceived ability that allows uh, tackling difficult tasks. So we um, wanted to distinguish between pleasure and enjoyment. Uh, our argument was that enjoyment only happens if you make an intellectual effort. That pleasure could be, you know, having a nice drink or uh, watching the view, but uh, it doesn't require strong concentration. Uh, enjoyment does require concentration. So here is the, the short version of the foreign language classroom anxiety scale that uh, Peter had developed in his PhD and that we used uh, in our paper. So you see there uh, a number of items that uh, refer to um, medium to high levels of anxiety. Uh, that also refers to physical symptoms of anxiety, like the heart uh, pounding, feeling nervous, uh, and, and also the social elements about uh, uh, feeling confident or feeling nervous and confused or feeling that the others um, know the language better than you do. And then uh, after having developed our original 21 item version, uh, we realized that it was a little bit too long. And so um, with uh, Eloise Bortus, whose picture is on there, uh, we um, designed a short form of our foreign language enjoyment scale where we had um, uh, foreign language enjoyment as a higher order factor. And we also had three lower order factor, namely uh, teacher appreciation, personal enjoyment and social uh, enjoyment. And you see the items there uh, in front of you. Um, and then uh, another um, emotion that has come uh, on the scene more recently, um, in the last uh, three years really, foreign language learning boredom uh, that um, Chen Chen Li uh, developed, and there is a picture uh, of her there. Uh, so it's defined as a negative emotion with extremely low degree of activation arising from ongoing activities that are over challenging or under challenging. And so um, I think a, a nice uh, metaphor would be video gaming. Um, I don't personally play video games, but um, I understand that uh, if you start playing a, a specific game, you start at the lowest level, at the beginner level. So where um, you don't need too much skill uh, to um, score some points, because if it was too hard, then you weren't going to score any points, you would probably abandon the game. Uh, also, it's not too easy, so you don't score maximum points from the start, because otherwise uh, it would be under challenging and you would abandon the game. So if you develop uh, a video game, I would say it's a bit like developing a good language class. It needs to have the appropriate amount of challenge and uh, it needs to take into account the amount of skill uh, that students have. And so Chen Chen Li in 2021 um, noticed that uh, learners who feel less competent in class, so they have a sense of um, uh, having limited control on the language, uh, they dislike their English classes, so they, they were uh, less engaged uh, in their English classes and they reported higher levels of 
uh, boredom. Um, so this is the first factor of uh, her scale. Um, so as you see, different um, symptoms of boredom, like yawning or, or the mind wandering off or having difficulties in uh, concentrating, uh, watching the, uh, the the time all because it, it it's, doesn't seem to be going forward. So uh, an eight, eight item uh, for language uh, class boredom scale. And then, as I explained, um, uh, the, the the first paper with Peter, the Janus paper, we wanted to find. Uh, the, the connection between enjoyment and anxiety. We use an online questionnaire, uh, collected uh, data from a large international sample. Um, I would say 80% were Western. The others were from different parts of the world, including China, South America, North America, uh, age range between 11 and uh, 75. And what we found was a moderate negative correlation uh, between enjoyment and anxiety, um, which allowed us to uh, argue that, in fact, these are uh, um, independent dimensions. But of course, if you typically experience high levels of enjoyment in the foreign language class, you will typically experience less anxiety. But it is possible to experience both simultaneously or to, ex uh, to experience none simultaneously. Uh, and so, crucially, <clears throat> these two uh, emotions are not in a seesaw relationship, meaning that the teacher who manages to push down anxiety in his or her class, that there is no guarantee that enjoyment will go up. And, and that has important pedagogical implications, and uh, maybe we can talk more about that uh, in the question time. What we also uh, discovered was that uh, levels of enjoyment and anxiety were very much linked to a number of learner internal uh, and a number of learner external variables. Um, so how advanced someone was uh, in the foreign language had a clear effect on their enjoyment and anxiety. So you see that the low intermediate and intermediate um, participants reported more enjoyment, but it wasn't that much more than their anxiety levels. However, as they reached um, advanced levels, then their enjoyment went further up and their anxiety went further down. Um, and this is the point where I always say that I'm absolutely certain that you would find the same pattern for the learning of any other skill, uh, whether it's cooking or doing karate or playing violin. At the very start, the fact that you start doing something means that you must have some enjoyment or that you expect to draw enjoyment from doing this new activity, but you also have anxiety that you don't know the rules yet, you have very limited skills, <clears throat> you're afraid that people may laugh at you or may run away if you come with your violin, um, and, and only as you become more confident and more skilled uh, do, do, does your anxiety uh, drop and, and your enjoyment goes up? <clears throat> and so we had uh, the, the, our study was a mixed methods one. So uh, we had one open question at the end of the questionnaire where we asked our participant to uh, describe in as much detail as possible how uh, they felt uh, during one of their most enjoyable episodes uh, in the foreign language class. And then we looked at what they said and the kind of activities they mentioned. And what we discovered was that uh, their episodes that was typically activities that empowered them, where they could do something where the teacher was not involved, where they were encouraged to be creative and bond with classmates. Uh, and they also very often mentioned that they had received praise uh, from their teacher or encouragement, uh, also from other peers and that the classroom uh, atmosphere was positive, that uh, there was joking, there was trust, and there was uh, respect. And then uh, a typical uh, example of um, uh, mixed uh, emotions uh, was um, the activity of speaking to the whole classroom. 
Um, and here, uh, one participant who explained that she was nervous, she felt her heart pounding, but she also felt great standing there and expressing her opinion and, and, and realizing that everybody is listening. Um, so it, it's clear that in, in this particular moment, she was experiencing both high enjoyment and high anxiety. So one doesn't uh, make the other impossible. Um, here, uh, a, a little uh, quote of a participant talking about flow, and it's something that I will talk about in more detail uh, next week. Um, so they, they had a class uh, room uh, discussion. It was challenging, fascinating, heated. Uh, we were very involved. It was productive. And I forgot about the time. So that's a, a typical characteristic of being in a state of flow. <clears throat> you suddenly lose track of time. Uh, time seems to be going faster uh, because you, you're enjoying the activity uh, so much. <clears throat> And then, of course, we looked at um, social biographical sources of foreign language enjoyment. We discovered that older learners, female learners, highly multilingual learners were typically reporting more enjoyment. Also, as I showed you the graph, more advanced learners, also people who felt that they were above average in their class, that they had a high level of proficiency, had had good results for the latest tests and exams, uh, they also reported more uh, enjoyment. And then uh, sources of enjoyment could also be an interaction between learner internal variables at different levels and learner external variables. Um, so if you have a positive attitude towards the foreign language or the foreign language culture, that's linked to more enjoyment. If you like that particular teacher, that might also be linked to high levels of enjoyment. Um, it might depend on the teaching method, and I will be talking more about that uh, in a minute. It might depend on some activities in the classroom that you enjoy. Um, you might not enjoy doing a translation exercise or a grammar exercise, but you might love talking or vice versa. Um, it depends on the kind of specific task that you're doing. Uh, it might also depend on the school, because some schools pay more attention to foreign language learning. Uh, and, and then students in that school uh, may enjoy their foreign language classes more. And then, of course, it depends on the larger societal, historical, political context. Uh, so if you are uh, the foreign language teacher and you are teaching a language that the students hate for some reasons, because there is a difficult relationship with the speakers of that language or that language group, uh, then it's going to be harder. So I would say that uh, these days it, it's not easy to be uh, say, a teacher of Russian uh, in the UK, because um, uh, Russia is not particularly flavor of the month. And then there is an effect of target language. So um, it, it, it's clear that uh, depending on the type of language that you are studying, uh, that, that can have a small effect on uh, the, the enjoyment levels. Uh, so, for example, we compared uh, enjoyment uh, in English versus um, uh, enjoyment in languages other than English. And we discovered that the enjoyment was slightly higher in languages other than English, although those learners typically already knew English. So if you decide uh, to learn, say, Japanese or Chinese or uh, Arabic, um, rather than the bog standard English as a foreign language, then you are probably a little bit of a language nerd and you just love learning languages. So that might explain why uh, the, the, we, we find these relatively small differences. So here, uh, a study by Chen Chen Li on learner internal variables and the, their effect on enjoyment and boredom. Uh, and as you see, uh, it's pretty symmetrical. Uh, the, the column with enjoyment uh, on the left and, and boredom on the right. So, uh, you can see uh, age of onset of uh, uh, onset of the foreign language learning uh, is negatively linked with enjoyment, positively linked uh, with boredom, um, meaning that if you start learning a language learner, you're typically going to be more bored uh, in that language, at least in the Chinese uh, EFL context. <clears throat> also, that high levels of proficiency 
uh, are linked with more enjoyment and less boredom. Uh, and again, also uh, clear uh, indications that attitudes towards the teacher um, are very much linked to uh, enjoyment and boredom, as well as attitudes towards the foreign language and the foreign language culture. And then uh, one of the uh, things that we discovered, in fact, in, in the mid, uh, well, in 2016, when we started working on this, was that teacher variables have a huge effect on foreign language enjoyment <clears throat> and you won't be surprised to hear that it also has a huge effect on foreign language boredom. So here uh, Chen Chen <clears throat> found that if you have an enthusiastic teacher then students will report much higher levels of enjoyment uh, and lower levels of boredom. Uh, interestingly also um, the Chinese and Arab learners enjoy teachers who are predictable. Um, whereas uh, in the Western context, it's just the opposite. We find that uh, enjoyment is linked to unpredictable teachers. So th there must be a cultural element there. Uh, and friendliness, if you have a friendly teacher, there's going to be more enjoyment and there is going to be less boredom. And then interestingly, whether your teacher is strict or not has no effect on these two emotions. And then, of course, with the pandemic and the and, uh, uh, brutal shift to, from uh, in-person classes to online uh, teaching. Uh, we discovered that um, in uh, the, the emergency remote teaching conditions, so the online classes, that levels of enjoyment were significantly lower and that there was also a, a smaller drop in anxiety. So students felt slightly less anxious uh, in their uh, online classes. Um, we started looking at this uh, in more detail, uh, so we uh, looked uh, at mostly Austrian uh, English foreign language learning and uh, in this more recent study we found the same uh, drop in enjoyment in online classes and a smaller drop in anxiety uh, in these uh, online classes, but we realized that the reasons uh, for enjoyment and anxiety were different uh, in online and in-person classes. So um, anxiety in the online classes was specifically linked to technical issues like my internet connection, is my computer going to give up on me? Am I going to lose contact? Um, but they were less worried about being outperformed by their peers. They, they felt less uh, anxious uh, sitting behind their desk at home uh, and, and they were also less anxious um, we, when the teacher asked them to uh, say something if they felt they were well prepared. And then enjoyment uh, was particularly linked to the rich social interactions uh, in in-person classes, um, but people uh, said that uh, students reported that they quite enjoyed the online classes from home because they, they didn't have to dress up. They could just sit in their uh, favorite chair and, and drink or eat while watching the class. So the, they also felt that they have, had more autonomy uh, in their online classes. So it was interesting to see that enjoyment and anxiety, although they drop um, in online classes, um, that the, there were also positive aspects to this. And here we repeated the same research question with a different population. These were Arab and Kurdish uh, English foreign language students. And you see we found the same patterns for enjoyment and anxiety. So less enjoyment and slightly less anxiety uh, in online classes. Uh, and we also found a significant increase uh, in boredom uh, in the online classes. And then uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more to you about um, the paper that we um, presented at Eurosla uh, in Birmingham uh, earlier this year and that is currently under uh, submission with the Canadian Modern Language Review. Um, data we collected from 181 French pupils from three different uh, secondary schools, so they were 11 year old. Uh, they had four one hour uh, EFL classes uh, per week. Um, four classes were taught 
with a novel uh, approach called the neurolinguistic approach, uh, where teachers are encouraged to adopt strategies that focus on language use uh, in spontaneous communication throughout the lesson without previous practice of vocabulary or forms. Um, so the, the aim of this neurolinguistic uh, approach, I don't like the word neurolinguistic approach. Uh, in Canada, they use the word intense French uh, to, to uh, describe it, which I, I like more. Uh, and so it's, uh, it focuses on authentic communication uh, in classroom interactions. So teachers ask what students feel, what they think, what their opinions are, and they themselves give their uh, feelings, their opinions. So uh, this seems to have a positive impact on learners' self-esteem and motivation because it's clear that the teachers are interested in them. So the teachers are not talking over their heads, they are involving them and they pay attention to them. And the other four classes had standard communicative uh, approach. Um, it's called communicative approach, but it, it, it's probably, it still includes lots of uh, grammar exercises, lots of writing, uh, translation stuff. And we collect the data once, uh, six months into uh, the school year. And so first we ran um, uh, three one-way ANOVAs to see whether there were differences between uh, the students in the standard uh, communicative classes and those with the neurolinguistic approach. Uh, and as you see, the red bar uh, is much higher for enjoyment. So uh, students in the neurolinguistic approach reported significantly more enjoyment, also significantly less boredom, uh, and um, also uh, relatively uh, less um, anxiety than their colleagues in the standard classes. And then uh, because ANOVAS allows you to um, do the analysis for one effect three times separately, uh, the advantage of using structural equation modeling is that you can look at the effect of uh, different variables uh, um, simultaneously. So here uh, we looked at uh, the effect of the teaching method on the three emotions. And uh, what we discovered was that um, the neurolinguistic approach uh, teaching method predicted higher enjoyment, lower anxiety, and lower boredom. So um, I, I think this has pedagogical implications, um, namely that it is important to talk to your students about things they are interested in. Uh, and invite their opinions and value their views. Um, we also had um, a qualitative part uh, in the study. Uh, we uh, interviewed uh, the students, uh, collected 30, 000, over 30,000 words, and uh, the uh, axiological analysis revealed four different orientation uh, orientations. The first one, uh, um, evaluative pressure. So. These students were complaining <clears throat> that uh, the, the, there was so much pressure to perform well in tests and, and, and that is, it stressed them, it created anxiety, trying to get the best grade and then uh, getting good grades is super hard. Um, and, and, but getting good grades is, is very uh, rewarding. Um, the second orientation was anxiety. Um, so being stressed out, having to speak uh, English in front of everybody because they couldn't do it and they uh, experienced shame. Uh, then uh, participant seven who um, described the the third dimension of enjoyment. It was uh, it was good today. We did an activity about Halloween. That was fun. I talked seven times and I went to the board twice. So this uh, is, is cute. Is clearly somebody who had enjoyed the class. And then uh, the fourth dimension was uh, boredom linked to the teaching method that applied particularly to the communicative approach. Uh, the, the, the participant eight saying, I didn't really experience a positive emotion in the English class. It's boring. I, I would prefer it to be more dynamic. So when we looked at the distribution of the different orientations in the two groups, uh, you see at the top the neurolinguistic approach um, these were uh, the people with 50% of their comments 
uh, was about enjoyment, uh, very little about boredom. Uh, whereas uh, in with the standard approach, you see there was um, uh, only a third of uh, the comments were about uh, enjoyment and uh, almost 30% was about how bored they had uh, felt uh, in their uh, first year English class. <clears throat> now, shifting to a slightly different uh, topic, um, it's that of the stability of learner emotions and the question whether uh, enjoyment, anxiety and other learner emotions change over time. Uh, and I did this study um, with my daughter Livia, being a proud dad. I can't help but include a, a picture of her at her graduation uh, in Oxford, where she studied French and linguistics in 2019, uh, before she went on to international relations. And now she's no longer uh, interested uh, in linguistics, unfortunately. But we did publish five papers together. And this was one of our first ones. Uh, so we had a, a pseudo longitudinal design, uh, meaning we compared uh, different age groups uh, in two schools of uh, British uh, school children. So 12, 13 year olds, 14, 15 year olds, 16, 18 year olds. Uh, there were 189 of them. Uh, and as you see, there was a slight dip in enjoyment for the middle age group, which is probably linked to the fact that they were preparing for their national GCSE exams. Um, and so the teachers were probably uh, preparing them for the test. So there was a, a little dip in enjoyment there, whereas anxiety remained um, uh, the same over uh, time. Um, then uh, uh, just a couple of months ago, we uh, uh, used another uh, pseudo longitudinal design uh, with a former master student of mine, uh, Rashid Mefta. Uh, we had uh, collected data from 502 Moroccan EFL learners. So what we did here, we compared the beginners with the intermediates and the advanced learners, and we asked them to report on their enjoyment, anxiety, but also their foreign language peace of mind, which is a, a new uh, emotion, uh, their boredom, and their motivation. And as you see, there was no uh, difference in uh, motivation over time, so that stayed high. Um, uh, but for the positive emotions, they went up, um, especially between beginner and intermediate level after which they stabilized. However, the negative emotions, anxiety and boredom, they fell most between beginner and intermediate level. And they continued falling, but not as sharply uh, between intermediate and, uh, and advanced level. And then, of course, you can also look at uh, fluctuation in emotion at the second by second uh, uh, time um, scale. Uh, so this was um, using the ideal dynamic method that Peter McIntyre uh, developed. And so we discovered that um, participants, they were in fact doing a task, they had to describe a picture and they were filmed while doing it. And then they had to look at the recording and report how anxious they felt uh, from second to second and how much they enjoyed uh, the task from second to second. Uh, and then they were interviewed on the reasons why they reported higher or lower levels of anxiety and enjoyment and then you discover, we discovered that you, you can get anxious because you can't find a word or you don't remember how to pronounce a word or your enjoyment goes down because you don't really enjoy talking about that topic. Uh, and so uh, what we found was that um, these um, fluctuations were highly dynamic. Uh, it was, uh, it, there was a clear negative correlation there for participant one, uh, but there was um, no correlation at the start for participant uh, eight, uh, and then a negative correlation uh, in the middle, and then a positive correlation at the end. So we, we see a huge amount of fluctuation. And then here, a fluctuation uh, over a period of uh, five consecutive classes, um, <clears throat> seven French foreign language learners, uh, and again, this is a study I did with my French colleague uh, Geda Bittighofer. And uh, looking at enjoyment, boredom and anxiety, these were 
uh, adult uh, learners, uh, we see that there was some variation in the third class, um, but not very much. Um, when we looked at the sub-dimensions of enjoyment, we, we see more uh, variation still, and again, um, especially in the third class. And then looking at um, uh, individual learners, uh, we noticed that quite uh, some learners uh, reported a drop uh, in teacher appreciation uh, during the third class. And then we discovered that the reason was that the third class had been taught by um, <clears throat> a different teacher. So they had the same, the same teacher for class one, two, four and five, but a different one for class three. And it was a teacher who wasn't quite as experienced. Uh, and so enjoyment levels dropped. So it shows that enjoyment, anxiety, boredom are relatively stable, but sometimes something happens that makes uh, the emotions uh, fluctuate. And here another study uh, with uh, my friend Kazia Saito, um, <clears throat> where we collected data from uh, Kuwaiti uh, students during one semester. We collected data four times at the start, second time, third time, and at the end uh, of the semester. Um, we ran repeated measure ANOVAs and found no difference over time for enjoyment, also no difference over time for anxiety, but we did find a significant drop in motivation over time. Um, you see uh, it, it, it reached uh, the, its deepest point at uh, time three, uh, and so we uh, interpreted this as um, an indication that um, motivation uh, might have dropped because they got bad test results or because it turned out to be harder than expected to do well in the foreign language class uh, over that uh, term. Um, and uh, their uh, enjoyment acted as a buoy uh, to keep their motivation afloat. Uh, and then with the, the same um, database uh, and we looked uh, more specifically at the effect of specific teacher behaviors uh, on enjoyment, anxiety and uh, attitudes, motivation. We discovered that teachers who were using the foreign language a lot in class, that they, uh, their students reported high levels of uh, enjoyment, also predictable teachers. Their students enjoyed that. And teachers who joked a lot, that also had a positive effect on uh, enjoyment and uh, attitudes motivation, but had no effect on anxiety. And then we discovered uh, an interesting uh, um, development, uh, namely that the levels of enjoyment dropped significantly for teachers, uh, for students whose teacher joked infrequently or very infrequently. So you can see that at time one, the difference is not significant, but over time it becomes more and more significant. And then we realized that maybe in fact it had nothing to do with the joking because we didn't have um, uh, classroom observations. So we don't know whether the teacher was joking a lot or not, but we realized that maybe the teacher that wasn't joking much, maybe was a bad teacher. Maybe it was a teacher who was um, too authoritarian uh, or didn't like the foreign language very much or felt uh, a little bit insecure uh, in teaching the language and therefore only did grammar or vocabulary stuff, um, uh, didn't take any risk. So uh, it's always uh, important not to jump uh, to conclusions because causality is always uh, a difficult uh, thing. Uh, in research. Um, what we also found was that um, anxiety uh, seems to be linked mostly to personality traits like trait neuroticism or trait emotional intelligence. So um, people who score high on neuroticism are more anxious. People who have low levels of emotional intelligence also have more uh, anxiety. Um, foreign language enjoyment, on the other hand, is less strongly linked to uh, personality, but it is positively linked to cultural empathy and to trait emotional intelligence. Uh, and, and boredom is linked to the personality trait boredom. Some people 
are more bored in life. Now, you may say, OK, why do I need to hear all that? Um, the answer is in the meta-analysis, emotions matter, uh, meaning that students who enjoy themselves in class will be significantly more willing to communicate. And we all know that students who speak up in class are students who are learning, who are progressing. So uh, the, the uh, meta-analysis shows you there that, that there was a large uh, uh, average positive correlation of 0.44. So um, uh, enjoyment is important. Uh, enjoyment is also moderately positively linked to academic achievement. Uh, the average correlation there 0.36. And anxiety is moderately negatively linked to academic achievement uh, minus 0.39. So again, it's important to make sure that your students are uh, experiencing enough positive emotions and not too much negative emotions for them to uh, perform well in class and in tests. Now, a quick word about learner psychology. Uh, there has been uh, an increasing interest also in teacher psychology and foreign language teachers uh, in um, psychology. They're standing in the middle of a whirlpool of learner emotions. And, and I think that um, teachers need to have this um, thermometer or antenna uh, to feel the emotional temperature of the class or whether students are bored and maybe it's time to switch to a different activity or do something um, exciting if they have been doing something quietly for a while. Uh, but of course, uh, teacher psychology, how teachers feel, um, is also linked to hegemonic power relations to power structures within the institutions. So it's, it's not just uh, an individual psychological thing. Um, here are a couple of um, covers of a recent book uh, on the topic, uh, including a book that I co-edited with uh, Christina Gokonu and Jim King, The Emotional Rollercoaster of Language Teaching, where we talk about the strategies that teachers can use to put on uh, a smile, even if they don't feel uh, like smiling. It's the so-called emotional labor. Uh, a lot of research in that field uh, is case studies, which is okay, but I love quantification, I love stats. So we collected uh, data from 513 EFL teachers and, and we analyzed them and we discovered that teachers who scored higher on emotional intelligence, for example, uh, reported more positive attitudes towards the students, more creativity in the classroom, better classroom management, better pedagogical skills, stronger motivation, more love of English, and also that um, uh, the EFL teachers who were not first language users of English, that if their level of English was high, then they also reported being more creative uh, in the class. And obviously teachers who had more experience they also reported having more positive experience, uh, attitudes towards the students. And we discovered that female teachers in our sample also had more positive attitudes uh, towards um, the students. Now, teacher emotions matter. And here are just um, four uh, papers that I co-authored with um, former students of mine. Um, namely, uh, the, the, the crucial thing really is uh, emotional contagion, uh, that if you are in front of a class or if you are faced with people and you look sad, you that sadness will be contagious, meaning people will feel sad with you. If you are happy, if you are joking, if you are positive, then your audience will follow you. Um, so... Um, uh, we, we, we don't want uh, teachers to be forced to pretend to be happy if they aren't, because emotional labor uh, is effortful. Uh, it takes a lot of energy uh, and um, uh, students may feel that the teacher is only pretending. Uh, so uh, it, it's important to be able to be sincerely uh, happy and to show positive emotions in a foreign language class. So to conclude, uh, learners' classroom emotions are the driving force in foreign language classes. They are 
affected and being affected. So they are both affecting and being affected by performance. So we have bi-directional uh, causality. Uh, and teachers can create these optimal positive classroom climates, uh, allowing students to explore, to play, to flourish, to make mistakes, to not feel shame because they, they aren't perfect yet. Uh, and, and it's crucial then to avoid too much repetition uh, or to avoid tasks that are either too challenging or not challenging enough. Um, it's crucial to help learners build a sense of confidence, competence and control. And obviously teachers need to control their own emotions. And, and being positive can be draining and just teaching can be draining. And any of you who have experience in teaching know how physically exhausted you can be uh, after a language class because you have given it your all. You have pushed and, and made and kept everybody uh, in your focus uh, and it's rewarding, but it is really tiring too. OK, after this, uh, here are some references. And I would be happy then to uh, answer uh, any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, yeah, just to remind everyone, the lectures are recorded, so you have access to both the lectures and the references as well. All those results, I think the amount of data might be a bit overwhelming, but at the same time, I think it's honest to say that it's really reassuring that we have like not just claims, but we have a lot of facts. We have evidence which is based on data. Uh, so online or offline, those people who are just participating online, I would like you to raise your hands if you want to ask questions. I can see quite a lot of people in the field. And those of you who are in the room, you have a choice. So you can do that on your mobile device. You can also raise your hands on the phone or laptop, but you can also join me and ask Jean-Marc a question. You will not be seen because the camera is not working for some reason. <laughs> uh, so time for questions is right now. So I, I could maybe start with um, answering the um, uh, implied criticism in your comment about the, the fact that I have shown you a lot of data. And I agree, um, I did do it, but as you guessed, uh, I did it on purpose. So I didn't want to overwhelm you with data, um, but I did want to convince you that the stuff, uh, that the conclusions are based on hard data on hard statistical analysis, on proper rigorous qualitative analysis, because um, if, if you talk about something that um, lots of your colleagues may find non-scientific, it's in fact doubly important to make sure that you are absolutely scientific, that your stats are right, that your qualitative analysis are right, that it, this is not just your opinion that emotions matter. It, it's meta-analysis that show that yes they do i mean that's the only way to convince uh, a, a school principal or a minister of education to do something uh, about it if you don't have hard evidence then you have no leg to stand on yeah i did not want to be too critical i have to say and uh, of course it matters to me too so uh, whenever I think of a class, when, whenever I think, and I think whenever any reflective teacher plans a class, they think not just about the content, but they also think what the people who are going to sort of receive this class or just participate in it, what they are going to experience. So sure. of course, if you put like five repetitive activities in line, you can't expect they will be interested after the third one or even the second one. It's not going to happen. Of course. But it's great to have scientific evidence of that. Right, anyone who wants to ask a question?
Roxana. Yes, Come yes. On. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I have a question like the first regarding the data. There was something said that uh, the students' enjoyment raises when their language level is higher. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like thinking if actually the, what, like the fact that the students have higher level, they start to be more critical to themselves and trying to be more precise and like finding even that more difficult, like in every skill, I guess, like the more advanced we're in something, the, the more there are things that we can improve. Uh, absolutely. Um, so what I think happens here is a, um, a r positive loop, a reinforcement, that as you put in more effort, you become better at something, and the being better at something um, pushes you to put yet more effort into it, and then you enjoy the fact that everything is working out better and better, and that you're able to express your opinions and that people understand you. And um, so I, I would say that's the positive loop. The, the danger is, of course, that it can go in the other direction also, that, I don't know, you get a bad test result or you're disappointed because the, your, your presentation wasn't judged to be very good. It might demotivate you or it might suddenly convince you that you're not good at it. And because of that, you might put in less effort to do well, or you, you might do it half-heartedly. And the result being that you will get, again, uh, a disappointing score and that people might not understand you and that you will feel more frustrated. And then you, you risk um, landing in a negative spiral um, and, and that might end up, you might end up giving up. Uh, on learning the foreign language. So that's why it's so important. Uh, of course, teachers need to be fair. And if somebody deserves a fail, that needs to be that needs to happen. But, but then it is crucial to try and make sure that the, the students don't get stuck in this negative spiral. And that even somebody who has not done very well, um, as a teacher, you need to be an optimist that there is potential for that student to do better and that you can help that student uh, reach that goal. OK, thank you. And also one more question, actually, like regarding teaching. Uh, what would you recommend if, um, for example, you are a teacher and you have your own teaching method and there are there is a student who basically um, is not enjoying your class, even though you're trying to do your best, actually. Mm. Should you then change the method of teaching or just um, like if you're a private teacher, for example, then just telling the student that should find another teacher, what would you do? <laughs> that, that's a hard one. Um, I think it is inevitable that some of your students won't like you very much or won't like your style very much. And some of it you can remedy because maybe some students feel that you're focusing too much on, say, written production or oral production. I mean, if, if, if that student is not the only one to say, well, yeah, I would love to do a little bit more of this or that. As a teacher, you can, you can uh, accommodate to that wish. So I would try to accommodate a little bit, but I would certainly not change my style. Um, if you have a joking style in class and some students don't appreciate you joking, well, too bad because uh, it's your style. Of course, you can avoid um, making jokes about inappropriate things. That that that's obvious. Um, but but I think you have to stay true to yourself. But you can navigate slightly towards left or right or center. Or so that that would be my recommendation. Right, thank you very much. And we have a following question, so by Professor Wyszniewska. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this very 
academic, very inspiring um, lecture presentation. Uh, I would like to refer to um, uh, enjoyment, and that's really great that after the years of the interest in anxiety, uh, we are finally interested in uh, some more positive issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've mentioned that um, uh, students enjoy the learning a foreign language more when they are more advanced. And there are two issues here, I would say. First, what about the enjoyment of the beginners, uh, which is connected a little bit with excitement. There is some new adventure ahead, right? So, um, and it refers not only to more adult learners, but also to kids who are sometimes very excited to learn something new. And then you've said that uh, the enjoyment is greater when the students are more advanced but um there are two things here one these uh, excited young learners beginners may lose the enjoyment after some time when they see that it is really hard work to learn a foreign language so that's one thing another thing is that uh even very advanced learners may not enjoy the classes or the learning, they just learn because they have to. They are ambitious, they need it for work or other purposes, and they are getting better and better on one hand. But on the other, other hand, they may look, they may not feel, they, they may not experience uh, that uh, enjoyment. Have you come across such cases in your studies? OK, thank you. That's a, a good question. Um, I should point out that foreign language enjoyment and foreign language anxiety, in fact, and probably also foreign language boredom, do not appear fully formed the first time you enter a foreign language class. Um, they typically emerge as sparks. So you may have a spark of enjoyment in your first class, or maybe a couple of sparks, but it's certainly not a fire yet. Um, and it's only after having had several classes in the foreign language, um, it, it, it also after having had several experiences of feeling anxious, for example, that you gradually develop this foreign language classroom anxiety. So it, it takes a while before it reaches a, a kind of a, a stable level. And I would say that the same is true for enjoyment. It takes a while before it reaches a relatively stable level. And then it does evolve um, more over time uh, in the sense, uh, and you were right, I mean, the sense of excitement that the beginners have, they may lose it because maybe the, te the, the teacher isn't quite as exciting as they hoped they, uh, he or she would be, or maybe the method is pushing too much putting too much emphasis on things they are not excited about, or maybe they realize it's too hard or it requires so much work uh, and they might get disenchanted with the foreign language class for lots of reasons. So there are plenty of reasons. But the thing is that if you compare these large group, uh, the large groups of um, more and more advanced learners, you do notice that the statistics is really solid, that the more advanced you are, the more uh, you, uh, re the, the higher your levels of enjoyment in the foreign language class, the lower your levels of boredom uh, and anxiety. And you will see next week when I talk about flow, uh, it's exactly the same pattern uh, that is repeated. So that's why it's important to just remind you that um, the foreign language emotions um, are somewhere in between um, in, um, personality states and traits. Um, so it, it does not, you are not born with foreign language emotions. You, you, you uh, acquire them gradually uh, and it becomes stable uh, in the course. Uh, of your uh, the, the classes that you take in that foreign language.
because it shows clearly these uh, trends in how emotions develop, raise and fall, right? But okay. but also case studies may be uh, of value to just pinpoint certain uh, cases which differ from what statistics says, right? Uh, Thank absolutely. you very much. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I am totally in favor of uh, mixed methods. Uh, I love the statistics. Uh, uh, the, but, but as you see, I also had uh, the voices of participants. And when you talk to uh, foreign language students, you, you realize that the experience is unique for each of them and that they all have reasons for being uh, happy or unhappy or bored and that sometimes have nothing to do with stuff that happens in the classroom or that the teacher is doing. Um, like um, the, the study with um, Pittighofer that I showed you the five classes of the adults uh, learning French as a foreign language. Uh, uh, the, my colleague was observing the classroom and she noticed that one of them didn't seem to enjoy it very much and seemed a bit bored and was playing on his phone. And so she interviewed him uh, after the class and she said, you know, you, you didn't seem to enjoy the class very much. What, what was the problem? And, and he said, oh, well, no, I just got a message uh, from back home. My my, uh, my mom is ill. I need to return. But then I have to abandon my job. So so I was extremely worried and I couldn't pay much attention to the class. So it, it's important to remember that that is possible, too, that um, as a teacher, you don't control it all. There are things that happen that are completely outside of your control. OK, I see Magdalena. Shetty, yes, we have a question from another researcher digging in the affective domain of language learning. Magda, the floor is yours. Yeah, it's me. Uh, thank you very much for your most interesting lecture. And my question actually um, refers to uh, possible future research. So I'm just, um, um, well, bearing in mind your wide experience in research on, on emotion, I would like to ask you um, about some suggestions. So I'm thinking of uh, planning um, my MA seminar and certain stu some students are thinking of researching emotions. Uh, right. But this 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 kind of research would be obviously sort of small scale research, qualitative mainly. So which particular emotions do you think might be kind of manageable? researchable for MA students uh, interested in the topic, uh, which are potentially interesting and worth researching from your perspective. Well, well, I well, know anxiety is kind of popular. Students consider that to be sort of easy to approach, but at the same time, anxiety has been researched so widely. Maybe we should turn to other emotions. Yeah. So, so I, I would make a case for not focusing on a single emotion, but uh, focusing on different emotions. Um, and, and I think that if they, that it would make most sense to talk about enjoyment, anxiety and boredom, because they are really the, the three crucial main emotions. Um, and they could use, you know, uh, the little questionnaire. It doesn't, it's only very short. Um, they could collect some some quantitative data from a small group and then they could uh, interview uh, their participants on, uh, you know, wow, you, you, you had the, the highest score on boredom in your group, you know, what, why, why do you feel this? Or, or you had the highest score on enjoyment, what, what is it that you enjoy so much? Or you reported high levels of anxiety, why? Um, that, I think those questions can be asked to uh, every single language learner uh, and, and that would be perfect small scale research. OK, thank you very much. So you you suggest combining different emotions yes, in absolutely. one research, these yes. which seem sort of yes. related. OK, thank you very much. Once again, it's really nice to have a chance to listen to your lectures. See thank you. Thank you, Magda. Thank you very much. We still have a chance for a question from the room. If anybody finds the courage. 
this, this is about being positive, right? So, so there are no stupid questions. So ask a question. Uh, 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 I would love that. I'll buy you some time because I have a question. I have like lots of questions myself, but I'm going to stick to one. So the question is uh, about this positive relationship between foreign language enjoyment and attainment. Would you say that it's a plausible explanation that those learners who endured for so long, they have just self-regulated better and part of the self-regulation is a better emotional self-regulation. And what I mean here is that uh, people, even in a, in a very boring class, and this is authentic stories of my friends studying and working in linguistics, even in, in very boring language classes, they find themselves something to do just to raise the level of arousal. So like uh, find interesting word combinations, play crossword puzzles with words, just find an occupation and stimulate the arousal. And in this way, uh, just self-regulate better emotionally. Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, absolutely true. Um, that's also something that my daughter reported doing in her French class, um, that she, she had two French teachers and one of them was an Italian who didn't know any French. And um, when she told me, I told her, why the hell would you be taught French by an Italian who doesn't know any French? And then she said, well, it, it's not really her fault. It's the, the headmaster told, who, told her, um, we don't have enough students for an Italian class. So either you teach French, which is in a romance language after all, or, or you're unemployed. So she needed the money. So she said, OK, well, I teach the French class, but she wasn't good at it. Um, so, so that's also why we, we, we shouldn't then uh, condemn people too easily. Um, I, uh, w when she explained it, I, I felt sorry for the poor Italian teacher forced to do something she wasn't trained to, to do. Um, and so uh, my daughter didn't enjoy her classes um, because they, they were really, really very boring. But she and her friends engaged in those self-regulation activities uh, that you just described, uh, Camille. Um, oh, sorry, uh, Jakub. Uh, they, they are the ones that uh, allowed her to remain motivated. And so she and her friends created a French discussion club outside of the class. Uh, so all the ways to keep uh, their interest in the language up. Now, the other question, of course, is whether uh, people who have reached an advanced level in a language, um, is, have they started to enjoy the language more? Or is it just that the ones who didn't enjoy the language learning much dropped out along the way? So I think we may have a little bit of both, that the population who reaches the advanced level is obviously not the same population that started as beginner. So that the patterns that we see can maybe also be uh, caused by a uh, dropout of the so-called weaker students who didn't enjoy the language learning very much. Yeah, of course, causality is never easy in these issues. Exactly. Thank you. I'd say it's the last chance for the question from the room, if anyone is willing to. Right, OK. Is it just stretching or is it a willingness to ask question? It was stretching, but OK, we do have a question. Can you do it from your own device or would you like to come here? We have a question from a student. We have succeeded. Great. It only Success. took two lectures. <laughs> Success. Success, right. Make yourself comfortable here. Um, hello, thank you for your election. Um, and I would like to ask, um, how can one preserve or build uh, an enjoying enjoyment or uh, some pleasure while learning language with, I don't know, starting from um, yeah, at the start or when one has a really mm -hmm. resource of words, vocabulary and so and so on. 
Well, let me just add that that's a valid, very valid question because more or less 50% of our students start learning German from scratch, which is the A1 level. So I think that's the, this kind of question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. It is a very good question. Um, I think it is particularly challenging if you are teaching a, a, um, a language class for beginners, um, because then obviously their skills will be very limited. Um, but I think you can communicate a sense of excitement and enthusiasm at the start. Um, you can make them um, understand that there are linguistic and cultural riches just outside their grasp, but that with effort uh, they will get there and they will be able to taste the riches. And then you have to mm, make students uh, understand also that um, language is, it, is, is so, it's so much more than language. So, you know, if you are learning German uh, as a, a, a Polish student, um, well, the German teacher could bring posters about um, art, about painting, about ballet, about music. You, you could talk um, about the, 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 the cultural riches, including, I don't know, the food or, or, or the football uh, or, you know, national um, stars that are known uh, in, um, in Poland, so international German stars. Um, so I, I remember teaching French um, at a 101 level in an American university in Brussels, and then the, my students loved telling me, oh, we don't know any French. And then I told them, I bet that is not correct. And say, yeah, we don't know any French. And then I laughed and I started singing, voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? Oh, that's a melody that they all know. They all knew. And so they were singing along and then I wrote out the text on the blackboard. And then of course they didn't know the exact meaning except that it was a bit raunchy. Um, and so that was a kind of a way in that by through the use of a song, they suddenly wanted to understand what these words meant. And then they wanted to sing along. And so it, it was a way to hook them. Uh, so I guess that um, a language teacher, just like a video game uh, developer uh, or, or you know, a sports coach, you need to hook your students. They need to feel that, wow, I can learn something here. This has potential for me. This is interesting. I can see myself at some point being better at this. And then obviously once you reach an advanced intermediate, well, an advanced beginner level or lower intermediate level, then you, you, you realize that you can actually use the language as a tool or that you can watch a television program in that language and you understand most of it, or you, you read a newspaper and you understand half of it, it can give you pleasure. Do you think that, oh, well, the time spent in the classroom wasn't totally wasted. I, I have discovered some really interesting things and maybe I'll go and stay a week or two uh, in Germany and then who knows, maybe you then fall in love with a German uh, partner and what can happen then? Um, so, the, yeah, that would be my answer. Thank you for the answer. I would also like to put my two cents in and say that uh, what I found best for myself whenever it comes to learning a new foreign language, because I've, I've learned Polish, I'm not, not Polish, I've learned Polish, uh, English, and right now I'm at some intermediate level of uh, German, are um is actually listening to songs which i like and right. then just yeah like like you said just translating the lyrics and then uh re-listening to the song again and again but without the lyrics, reading the lyrics and that's yeah. that, that's helped me to build my vocabulary and that's how i reached some proficiency in a language that, that's great but that's also something you could do in a language class um use songs or a little poem or a, a little uh, newspaper article about something funny. Um, so so you, you, you can create a, a, a willingness among learners to 
say something, to express their opinion, uh, to enjoy the taste of, of, of the, the pronunciation of these strange new words. It's like you develop an alternative identity. Thank you. It was very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, appreciate it. Uh, I think we have like two minutes. So if anybody still wants to ask a question. Right. And if not, then you have the next opportunity next week. So hope to see as many of you as possible here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Marc, for a fascinating lecture. Until next time. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.